well hello everyone and we are live and today i have rivka with me as the special guest rivka how are you i'm well thank you hello everyone well yes and rivka is an ex jew as you can see beside her name so we'll be talking about like judaism apostasy from judaism and other things about judaism and i thought that it would be nice because i am an ex hindu and judaism and hinduism are both like religions that are very much in grain with the uh, ethnicity uh, like so i thought like it would be interesting to see like similarities between judaism and how like you would like a similarities between judaism and hinduism and how you would like consider like because a lot of people just jewish people and judaism they just think all jewish people are Jude- uh, uh, like follow the judaism and stuff so i mean it's very difficult it gets sometimes very difficult to separate the religion from the ethnicity mm-hmm. so i thought it would be interesting to discuss that so what do you think um yeah absolutely yes be- so rifka would you introduce yourself please? so my name's rifka lea um i was um raised jewish religion um i have been um an apostate from Judaism I think from the time I can remember I didn't I wasn't open about it uh for a long time I also at some point in my early adulthood tried dabbling with other things I thought well maybe it's just the Judaism maybe I can try you know paganism or wiccan or dru- and I also thought you know i'm just rejecting the bs in one book to accept it in another and so i finally came out completely as um an atheist but i think that i didn't ever really believe in a god i, I i'm back in like give me like a few seconds i'll be back oh okay so i can keep talking um so as i said uh i don't think i ever really believed in uh, a god i grew up with um an immig- uh immigrant and first generation uh eastern european jewish family we have one uh moroccan relative my great great grandfather but mostly we were eastern european jews which is uh in the jewish world it's divided up into European Jews are called Ashkenaz or Ashkenazim which is the plural um and then there's Jews from Spain and Morocco and Tunisia places like that those are Sephardic or Sephardim and then Jews from the Arab world Yemen Syria Israel originally um uh all these uh Iraq Iran those Misrahi. Uh, so there's kind of these three groups. I grew up in an Ashkenaz family. My mother was very religious as a young person, but not as much once I got older. Um, more religious than my father, though. But for me, seeing all this religiosity, I perceived it as basically work for women. So the men would go to temple and or synagogue, shul, we called it temple. Um shul is the Yiddish word for it um which my parents spoke Yiddish especially to each other when they didn't want me to know what they were talking about. But the women followed the rules. And that's what my perception of it was. And there was a lot of work that fell on the women particularly because friday night is the sabbath till sundown on sundown on friday till sundown on saturday and you wouldn't use electricity you wouldn't drive um you couldn't turn on the stove because in the bible there's a prohibition on lighting a fire so they consider electricity like lighting a fire and so it's a lot of work it's a lot of work for the women um and there were a lot of rules about what you could and couldn't do especially as women i don't know if a lot of people know this but there's all kinds of prayers for everything before you do anything in judaism and the a jewish man's first morning prayer 
Now, granted, he gets up and he thanks God for letting him wake up and he thanks God for washing his hands and he thanks God for letting him pray. But the, the real prayer, the first prayer is to thank God that he wasn't born a woman. So hearing those kind of things, it makes you think as a kid, at least for me, that God's not real interested in you as a woman. You're a lower tier. And uh, my parents, you know, my brother was the golden boy. They, you know, lifted him up. He was the son who, you know, carries, even though Judaism is matrilineally descent, it's very important to have a son. And I actually have a theory on that, if I can elaborate. So most of the Abra the other two Abrahamic religions, Christianity and Islam, are patrilineal descent. So the, if the father's Christian or the father's Muslim, the children are Muslim. Whereas in Judaism, the woman has to be, the mother has to be Jewish. And then the child is automatically Jewish. And my theory on this is, because Jews were persecuted, kicked out of places, conquered, that the matrilineal descent is really a survival mechanism. It wasn't so much part and parcel of the original part of the religion, but I believe that the matrilineal descent became a survival mechanism in order to keep passing on that Judaism. Because if you're a conquered people and all the men in your you know, village or your group are murdered, and then the women are taken as, uh, you know, contraband as, and then most of the time absorbed into the conquering tribe, the men will have sex with them, they'll have children. Well, if the women are Jewish, all those children, despite having been conquered, are still Jews. So it's a way of making sure you're making more of yourself at all times. So, you know, some people may not believe that they may be able to find the text where it says this, but I never really found that so much. But when I thought about it as a survival mechanism, it made a lot of sense to me. But um, yeah, so back to the matrilineal descent. So as I said, even though it's matrilineal descent, it's important to have a boy. And um, my parents wanted me to have a bat mitzvah which we didn't even have until, you know, maybe the 50s, 60s. It became, um, it, when my parents were growing up, girls didn't have bat mitzvahs. And that's when you become an adult. So for girls, it's 12, I think. Boys, it's 13. It may even be a little younger. But uh, so it's, uh, and a bat mitzvah isn't something you have, actually. It's something you become. So then you're an adult in the eyes of uh, the Jewish congregation. And it's a lot of work. You have to read all these, the Torah. You have to memorize the Torah portion. You have to be able to explain it. You have to read Hebrew from the Torah, which is the holy book of Judaism. And there's no vowels in the Torah. Whereas if you would read Hebrew in a book or write a letter, you would have vowels. So it's a lot of work, but there's a big party and you get lots of money. So a lot of people want to do it. Plus your parents are pushing you. Well, I didn't want to do it. And so my father would drop me off at the synagogue and he would drive around the corner and I would go down to the street with these Christian kids that I knew and hang out with them until it was time to come back. So when the rabbi called my parents, the rabbi being like the, it means teacher in Hebrew, you know, so similar to an imam, a priest, uh, you know, pastor, about why I wasn't showing up. My father said, well, you know, he was angry, not so much that I wasn't going, but that I was pay, he was paying for it. And so he said, well, if you're not going to go, you know, you don't have to, because I'm not going to pay for it. And this is verbatim. And he said, and it doesn't matter anyways because you're a girl. So that kind of tells you the view of where religion is and or women are in that religion. So. Yep. And 
Sure, like uh, Dolly in the live chat saying, children in Islam get their religion from their father's side and not the mother's. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to like, I was thinking about the same thing, like just a hypothetical situation, like let's say a Muslim man and a Jewish woman marry, like which is which may sound very unlikely considering the relationship between the two religions right now. But let's say they marry. So what will be the religion of the child? Like what will they consider? Well couple things muslim men can marry a christian or a jew it's allowed um and uh the prophet had a jewish wife and other jewish concubines oh, no no I'm, I'm not i'm not oh, no, no, i'm just saying yeah. i'm saying the current oh, relations i don't between know muslims. i would assume yeah. that the man's religion yeah. would supersede the woman's in Islam, if he's Muslim, that means the children are Muslim. Now, the mother might say, well, you know, guess what? The kids are really Jewish, you know, and that's how you'd be perceived, you know. And I remember my uh, daughter was dating this guy from England. He was um, a Marine, British Marine. And he, my daughter found out that one of the grand great grandmothers on his mother's side was Jewish. And I'm like, Oh, well then Jack's Jewish. <laughs> you know, like, and not that I care, but it's so ingrained in you, you know? And also there's this, um, there's a lot of cultural stuff. So we're talking about the religion. Okay. So that's this set of, ideological beliefs that you subscribe to or you believe in God or you don't, which isn't necessarily even that important in some level of Judaism. It's doing what you're supposed to do because you've been chosen by God. So you need to follow this set of rules because he chose you. But um, there's at least amongst American and Eastern European American Jews particularly in, uh, you know, New York, New Jersey, Cleveland, Florida, a lot of these places, there's, uh, it's kind of a joke that people make, but it's actually, it really is true. So stereotypes have a lot, a little bit of truth in them. Is this constantly, you know, making sure you point out who's Jewish and who's not, or noticing, or there's a, a word for when you're trying to let someone know that you're Jewish to see if they're Jewish, it's called, they call it bageling, like a bagel. So you would drop some sort of hint or you would say something. And uh, that was always uh, very important to know um, because, you know, they're, they're an MOT, which stands for member of the tribe. So it's important to know who's a member of the tribe and who is it. And that was my mother's absolute favorite thing. You know, you'd watch a movie and she'd see somebody say, hmm, he looks Jewish. Oh, that's a Jewish name. Or, you know, I heard so-and-so is Jewish, you know. It's very important to keep that score, you know. Yes, but, that's uh, that reminds me of like the society I grew up in because here as well, like people are like, well, if people see like some, like let's say I'm watching a um, Hollywood movie and my grandfather walks in and he sees like a brown South Asian looking guy on the movie and he's like, oh, is that like Indian actor? Like, or usually Hindu, like they have like become like Indian and Hindus become synonymous, which mm -hmm. I don't really like, but uh that's that's how they go or like some name oh that's a hindu name and this like this hindu or uh, indian identity that's like and that's mm -hmm. also like uh the bad thing is like that's also currently in india the situation is like that's also used to identify muslims because they don't have a hindu name they have a muslim name so mm -hmm. for discrimination and stuff so that's kind of bad but yeah i mean i think it's kind of thing like people are very concerned, like very obsessed with their ethnicities. And that's just like how society, like even the young people would be like that because they grow up in that kind of society. Like, and I think it's, it, a lot of people really need to know what are you, you know? And then they can decide what they think they know about this group of people 
or how to act or how they might act or, you know, and particularly if you run into religious Jews, you know, are, are it, you know, okay, you're a Jew. My name is very apparent that it's Jewish. Um, so then if you're not, if they see you doing something, you shouldn't be that, you know, um, my father who was less religious than my mother, um, was seen in the town over eating what they call would be forbidden meat, meaning that, uh, he never ate pork, but in Judaism. And so that's similar to Islam, no pork, but in Judaism, if you keep kosher, which are the dietary laws, the kashrut, you can't have milk and meat together. So no cheeseburgers, you know, um, things like that. But my father would eat cheeseburgers and someone saw him with these other people in the other town, presumably either not Jewish or, you know, Jews who didn't care and told my grandmother and then other people in their building. And he was a teenager at this time. And some of the parents in his building told my grandmother that their child couldn't hang out with my father. He couldn't come to their house because he was seen eating something he shouldn't be, you know? So yeah, there's a lot of scolding. Uh, that's kind of the way you keep people in line. If people are find out that you're doing something, there's some very religious Jewish communities in Israel and other places they call Haradim. So, you know, ultra Orthodox and in New York city as well. And, um, that someone finds out, for example, that you were eating something you shouldn't be eating. Sometimes they'll even put posters up all over so that everyone, even if they don't know you, they'll say, oh, you know, so-and-so was, you know, eating cheeseburgers or so-and-so was seen driving on Shabbat or, you know, something like that. And then it becomes this form of uh, societal coercion as well. Similar to a lot, a lot of other uh, very uh, strict religious groups. I know Islam has a similar sort of societal coercion that keeps people, you know, in line and, Often it can end up if you leave those communities, you lose your children, your parents won't talk to you, you know, and because some of these communities are so insular, you know, there's people who grew up in the United States, in New York City, who barely speak English because they in most of these are Eastern Europeans, Hasidic or Haredim communities speak Yiddish. Um you know, don't study secular subjects. And so you have somebody who could graduate high school in, you know, 2020 and can barely speak English because of the insular nature of the community. Yeah, I think so. The thing that you mentioned, like about keeping people in line, I think like that's kind of the shame culture. Like, oh, you have, mm -hmm. if you do this, you know that you will be ashamed like to face people from your community so that uh, yeah that's in the indian society as well like mm -hmm. so people like in my state beef is legal but like the youth is different the most of the youth i think they eat they wouldn't mind eating beef but a lot of the people wouldn't like eat because well they some of them feel disgusted like that's not even according to like hindu like what Orthodox Hindus believe they think the cow is sacred. A lot of Hindus they don't eat beef because they feel disgusted by beef. Mm -hmm. That's not in line with how uh, cows are sacred or something. But they just feel disgusted by beef, or they're like ashamed. Like if I eat beef, what will like people, other people think? Because they think the society considers beef as disgusting or not something to eat. And if I eat this, then what will other people consider of me? So that's kind and of thing. And that food thing, you know, I noticed even um, people that I know who, excuse me, who aren't Jewish anymore, practicing uh, the religion, um, a lot of um, ex-Muslims I know still can't cross the pork line, you know. Um, and, I mean, my mother eventually ended up eating a cheeseburger. My father tricked her into eating a cheeseburger. 
when she was pregnant with me. Um, but, uh, and so she would sometimes, you know, but she would never eat pork ever, ever, you know, it would never come in the house. It would never, you know, cross her mind to have a ham sandwich. And for me, you know, I, I've eaten pork. I eat, I've eaten sausage, I've eaten pepperoni on a pizza, I even ate pork chop. But what I never ate was a ham, like a whole ham, until I, um, I must have been 33 years old. It was a Christmas. It's my ex-husband's family. And they said, oh, you know, have some ham. And I said, I've, I've never eaten it. Not because I was, it just never was in my thought process to eat ham. And they were all shocked, you know, because he wasn't Jewish, obviously. And um, I finally ate it. And I'm like, well, you know, it's actually not that bad. <laughs> but so even me, who doesn't believe in God, who rejected Judaism, a lot of it because of all the rules, you know, what you can eat, what you can eat. You know, if you eat meat, you have to wait six hours before you can eat dairy. If you eat dairy you know, anywhere from an hour to three hours, depending on how, you know, before you can eat. So which, um, how you have sex, when you have sex, um, you know, which shoe to put on first, you know, to that, to that, it's that, uh, banal that it gets down to even that, you know, which shoe you put on, which shoe you tie first, you know, what clothes do you wear? What do you say first in the morning? What do you say at night before you go to bed? You know, all these rules. And that's what I felt really imprisoned by, particularly for the women, you know, because the whole week led up to this Friday where you can't use any electricity. So you've got to get all your food together and make sure everything's some, make sure you leave a light on. If you don't, you have to call. If you if you live in a neighborhood like in, in New York, when my mom was a kid, they would call a Christian if they needed something like that. They call them a Shabbos goy. Goyim is the is the Yiddish word for uh, Gentile. So maybe you needed something for whatever reason. So you have to call the Christian, and uh, you're not really allowed to pay them. But maybe you'll, oh, I made you this plate of cookies. And, oh, somehow, you know, a dollar is in the plate of cookies or, you know, these kind of things. So it's so ridiculous that, and and then to get around these things. So God has these rules, right? That you're not allowed to do this or this or this or this. But, and this is how I always perceived Judaism, that it's not, it wasn't really a religion. It was a contract. And like any contract, there's loopholes that you can kind of go around. You're still holding to the contract, but you're so, for example, you know, leaving a light on all Shabbos or even better ovens that have Shabbos mode that you program and then they magically turn themselves on. So you're not turning it on. So, oh, it's OK. Or my favorite, which is very pagan. So you're not allowed to carry anything in your pocket on Shabbat. So walking from your house to the synagogue, you know, you can't keep your Alka-Seltzer and your lip balm. You can't carry anything in your pocket. So, and you'll see this if you go to New York City or other very uh, religious Jewish neighborhoods, they have uh, a boundary maven. A maven is the word for the expert in Yiddish. And he'll put up this, what's called an eruv. It's a line, they usually use fishing line, all from the synagogue being the center, all around all the community's homes. And they sort of push the walls of the synagogue out into this air of space and push the walls of your home in towards the synagogue. So technically, you're not actually on the street because you're within this string. So you can carry. But wouldn't you think God knows you're tricking and you're, you know, not doing, but oh no, you can do it. So this is this ridiculousness in order to follow ridiculous rules. I mean, it's just like proof that humans are inconvenienced by religions and they will 
keep finding loopholes to like avoid like because i don't think most people would like to do the rules like follow the rules they don't want to like they're inconvenienced and they will just because it's the, in their tradition they have been doing it and they see everyone else doing it they just keep finding certain loopholes to go around that and it's like even like even for like they just outright disobey some rules they're like um for some muslims or even some hindus in my experience they're like oh this is mentioned in the scripture and like this but they're like oh no i don't think something will happen because of that i don't think i'll be punished or anything because like they are inconvenienced by it and they don't want to believe that something will happen that's a minor rule for them like even though it's not like mentioned anywhere oh, this is a minor rule they just think it like that because it's inconveniencing thing or something something they don't like i mean they will do they don't they are not inconvenienced by it they were like oh this, no we need to follow this rule because this is like mentioned in the scriptures and this pundits in case of hindus this pundits are saying this as a rule so or something like for example in hindus like most people don't know the scriptures so they just go by what the priests are saying like the brahmins they mm-hmm. just say like you need to follow these rules these rules so if they okay. don't like the rule if they if someone doesn't like the rule they're like oh this brahmin was not a good one like probably some like fake one just earning money or something they will they will go to an, some brahmin who actually gives them something like rituals or practices or rules they would like and then that's like oh this is the good brahmin well <laughs> i have a question because that's sort of so judaism I'm going to talk about a couple of things and then I'll get to my question and how it relates to what you just said about, you know, shopping for the, the, the priest that, you know, fits, you know, your conception of how you want to, to live this religion. So in, in, in Judaism, mo- now in the, in the modern world, there's, it's divided into like three, three groups, you know, Orthodox, conservative and reformed. Orthodox, a lot of people know that's sort of what people think about when they think about, you know, Jews maybe wearing the long black coat and the curls and the women have cover he- their heads covered and there's modesty and you don't eat pork and you keep Shabbat. Some are very extreme on that l- end and some are less extreme. Conservative is kind of in the middle. Well, maybe we women don't necessarily cover the head and the men don't wear long cloaks and but you know we don't eat pork and we you know we're a little more conservative and then there's this thing that they make jokes about a lot of especially in uh, Israel um it's reform judaism so it's you want to eat pork go ahead you want to have a cheeseburger fine you don't want to you know you want to drive on shabbat go ahead but you're still jewish and you still go for the holiday and you still so it's sort of like this you know judaism light and um so that to me is kind of an example of what you're talking about you know you just keep refining it until you find something that works for you and then also having sort of an enlightenment and a reformation christianity you know had a reformation um and uh i what i was going to ask was so in hinduism do you have it divided up in sort of these more orthodox sects and then there's sort of you know the hinduism yeah, light I mean, it's not exactly like a specific in hinduism but they're like families and just people in general like they're like someone like oh yeah you can do this this yeah god won't mind if you do this no one you are not breaking any rules if you do this or go do this but you are coming with to the festivals with us you are celebrating this with us and so that's mm-hmm. like the more liberal hindus in india and mm-hmm. then they are like a bit conservative were like oh no um just like conservative people in general mm-hmm. um and then there's also like this different hindutva people that are emerging they're like they they act like they're very like following the scripture and everything but n- most of it like no they are not exactly following the scripture i mean a lot of what they do is can be justified by scripture but uh they are not doing everything as per the scripture also uh, this is like highly orthodox they like completely like their homes are like completely decorated with religious items muslims are probably not allowed like you cannot like their kids are not allowed to be friends with muslims 
things like this are very orthodox and they cast everywhere like you cannot be friends with lower caste people as well and but even even among the a uh, little bit liberal slightly like between the liberal and the conservatives i think uh there's this gray mm-hmm. area where people are like they will act liberal like if you see them like if you don't uh, know them like really good you will think oh these people are like liberal hindus but when like uh, when they go for marriages and stuff they will see caste so is the husband of this caste if the bride of from this caste or they will see caste and sub castes and things so like even that exists even among the liberal ones and the youth like the youth around me in my city so like there are youth who are conservative very conservative but in my city most of the youth is like yeah they call themselves hindu because they're like they think everyone's like because they're born from a hindu family like because that's what really, their parents yeah, told them they were yeah, yeah. They, they don't they don't care about the religion they don't they eat beef they do whatever the fuck they want they they might even rebel against their parents and they don't even care about the like uh what's the word um the word the, i can <laughs> what the dogma or whatever the identity the identity mm. the identity mm. they don't even care about the identity of a hindu they're like yeah it's just what my parents are so i just call it myself or whatever yeah like yeah it's like I, whatever so. it's just like a reflex almost yeah. yeah so as far as what you were talking about scripture not scripture what you're supposed to do. so the thing with judaism is that it's a very a high uh, religion that's big on debate and discussion. So you have all these, so the Torah, the Holy Book, and then the, the Talmud as sort of the corollary to that where you see like, oh, Rabbi so-and-so said that God will meant this. No, Rabbi so-and-so said, well, I think God meant that. And you'll have these, this goes on book after book, years and years, and then so, you know, so and so, somebody in the yeshiva, which is a school, is studying this particular passage, and so then they study what all these different rabbis and sages said about it, and then the people who contradicted that, and then so it's this constant debate about what it actually means, and despite there being a lot of rules that you're supposed to follow and way modes of behavior, you know, 613 commandments. I was always taught and I always sort of learned that it's okay to question, that it was a religion of questioning because you had all these famous rabbis and sages and thinkers constantly questioning, well, what did God really mean by this passage? Or, well, I don't know if that word means that. I think it actually translated, you know, and so, there's so much of that that to me it kind of makes sense that you would have this varying degrees of belief or um, adherence and it also um, to go on that note the large number of people who are atheists particularly in the United States or even sometimes call themselves Jews and follow a lot of these rules, but don't necessarily believe in God. And growing up, I was always under the impression, and I had to have gotten this from somewhere, the teachings and the things that adults said and the, you know, that belief in God isn't even necessary to be Jewish. Even the part. Yes, that's no. that's so similar to like because like these religions have been so like intertwined the religion uh, uh, the religion and the ethnicity like even for Hindus like like you you have heard of the term Hindu atheist so mm-hmm. in my opinion there are two kinds of Hindu atheists one are like just they just consider oh because like uh, it's just my culture and ethnicity so I mean it's more like a cultural Hindu. Uh, well, then I don't like the term Hindu atheist for many reasons. And then there are like, so they are like, oh, it's because we are born here in India and like most people are Hindus and things, but I don't really believe in the gods or anything. And then there are people who are like, 
uh, they do follow like the rules. They think like, oh no, there probably isn't a god. God is probably a metaphor for something, and they don't really believe in the god. But the ancestors they made these rules for a reason. There has to be some scientific reason exactly. behind, it. and they they're like, oh no, we need to follow these rules because there is something behind this. They were wise people, and like, no, they they didn't know shit. They were from Bronze Age. <laughs> so, oh. Well, some people think that in order to have you know some sort of goals in life or to be happy you need structure you know so those people could be very disciplined even if it wasn't religion like they you know that discipline that structure this way of forming your thought and your actions regardless of whether you believe there's a god or not they perceive it as beneficial and your point about marriage I think this happens to a lot of people and I see it not just in Judaism or Hindu, but across the spectrum, people aren't necessarily that religious, but it's important to marry within the religion or especially that the children have to learn about it. Like you could have, you know, people who don't care, they never went to synagogue or church or temple, whatever. But as soon as they have kids, they feel some sort of obligation to indoctrinate the kids with this, religious identity. But I, I want to get back to the identity point. So it's interesting you were talking about atheist Hindus. So I have a friend, people may know him, uh, Ali Rivzi. He wrote a book called Atheist Muslim. And a lot of people were like, what? Isn't that oxymoronic? How can... And it, I didn't find it at all confusing. I absolutely understood it because I know so many people who call themselves Jews but they're atheists. So, but, and for me, like, I don't identify at all as a religion, uh, you know, as the Jewish religion, but first of all, being Jewish is put on me sometimes by the outside world, just by looking at my name immediately. There's assumptions from Jews, from anti-Semites, from Christians, from Muslims, whomever make these as, oh, well, you know, well, yeah, I have a very, very Jewish sounding first and last name. And some of the culture and the way I speak and the things I say, I grew up, I was born in New York City. My parents grew up in New York City. They're New York City Jews, immigrants. They spoke Yiddish, all these things. So I can't get past that. You know, even if you didn't know my name, you might think, once you hear, if you're familiar with that, that I have a very Jewish way of representing myself, but that's the, the ethnicity part, the culture part. But interestingly, my friend, David Silverman, who used to be head of American atheists gave this speech once at, um, secular, uh, the humanistic Jewish society. I can't remember. It was one of these secular Jewish societies. So it's people who are Jews, call themselves Jews. Some of them even practice the Jewish rituals and the holidays, but there's no deity involved. They may rewrite some of the prayers to be, you know, secular or humanistic. So he gave this speech called, and this was the very first time he gave it. And you can look it up on YouTube. It's kind of raw because it was the first time. And it's called, I'm not a Jew and you aren't either. And in this speech, he talks about, you can't really call yourself a Jew if you don't believe in God or the Torah, the religion, because that's the only thing that all Jews have in common. Because there isn't specifically a Jewish culture. I was talking about my Jewish ethnicity and culture, but that's New York City, Eastern European Jews. But if you go to Baghdad, the culture of the Jews there is completely different. They don't speak Yiddish. They eat different food, different languages. You know, you go to Spain, Portugal, Greece, Yemen, Lebanon, you know, Shanghai, India. So none of these groups of Jews have the same food, the same languages, the same culture, the same, you know, uh, behaviorisms, you know, things like that. The only thing that they all have in common is Torah. So what was really interesting about, and 
intellectually, he's right. That is true. You know, and you can even say, well, even in Israel, right? So Judaism maybe is the state religion, but not everybody who lives there is Jewish by any means. Just like in England, the religion of the state religion or is Anglican, but a huge percentage of the country is not Anglican. So it's not even a state religion. And until you had Israel, you didn't even have a country. So we couldn't say it was associated with a land mass. So intellectually, you know, he, he's right. But when you hear that and you've been raised thinking of yourself as a member of this specific group, even if you don't believe in God or follow the rules, but somehow this makes you who you think you are, it could be really difficult to hear. And it broke a lot of people, you know? And um, is so... I wanted to bring that up because in this discussion of ethnicity, culture, religion, you know, the, the, the culture of Jews in Morocco is completely different than the way I grew up. Some of the prayers, yeah, the tones of the songs, a few things, but it's not the same at all. They don't even have the same food, the same, you know, Jewish language, nothing. So. That in and of itself shows you kind of, I think, how David really was on to something in that regard. So I say I'm an ex-Jew in the fact that I reject the God of Abraham. Re you know, and I used to, when people would come, missionaries would come knocking on my door. When I was really young, I would say, oh, no, thank you. I'm Jewish because it was just a way for them and especially if they were evangelical, like, oh, okay. We, you know, they, that excited them. Our boss was Jewish, you know, but it was a way to get them to go away. Then I mean, I, uh, then oh, I started, yeah, oh, sorry. But then I started saying, you know, Jesus Christ is not my savior. That was very specific. And what I have done for the last probably 20 years is I say, I reject the God of Abraham. And so that's pretty specific. I am rejecting this God. But I have, some people have said, oh, you talk a lot and you use your hands and you, you're always interrupting and you're loud. Well, you know, no, I'm not doing any of that stuff. I'm just Jewish. You know, so I might use it in that context, being like the atheist Jew or the atheist Muslim that I started out this whole discussion with. Yes, so the title of like David Silverman's speech is sounds like a title that I would really agree with because I say that I'm not Hindu even though people tell me you are a Hindu. For example, like the first time when I told my like family, yeah, I don't consider myself a Hindu. They were like, then what are you? Like, are you a Muslim? They, they immediately go to Muslim because like they need to have like this is binary in India. You are either Hindu or Muslim or Christian sometimes. But mm -hmm. like the first thing they would go to is Muslim because they're like seen as like the enemy of Hinduism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a surprise. But I, yes, like people don't really like, so I say that I'm not a Hindu because like what is Hinduism? Like I, I think the modern Hindus, but they have like, they have a cunning answer to this recently. But like, what is Hinduism? Like it is like, the Gita, you, the people who consider the Gita, the Vedas, like Hinduism is technically like people who consider like the religion that considers Vedas as the highest authority revealed by a divine means to the first sages on earth. That's literally what Hinduism is. Uh, so if you consider the Vedas as the authority, you are a uh, Hindu. And then like the Puranas, the Gita, the uh, Devi Mahatmya, these scriptures, uh, Come secondary, even though right now Gita is considered as the most important one, uh, by like Hinduism, the religion doesn't consider the Gita as the most important one. It considers the Vedas as the most important one. But so people are like, uh, because if, if you talk about culture, Hindu culture, well, India has like several cultures in it. Like just India, there's, if you go from west to east of India, you'll find completely different cultures. If you go from north to south, completely different cultures. They're very, very different cultures and they're 
tons of cultures in it just in this one country so what culture and people like often say oh it's just like the combination of cultures of the people of india is hinduism and uh, which is like so would you consider this because uh, indian muslims why are they not hindu then because you don't consider muslims as hindu you don't consider christians as hindu uh, so but they are indian they were born in india the ancestors were indian they converted to those religions but the culture has been so like assimilated like islam has like in india muslims and christians also have caste and they follow very hindu like practices sometimes like th- it has been the cultures have been assimilated very much so but you don't call them hindu like you say oh if you are an atheist you are hindu but why an atheist why if you if you are a muslim or christian of indian descent then why are you not a hindu then it's just the atheist is just for the atheists like that i literally got someone telling me that oh the only way you can actually leave hinduism is if you convert to another religion not if you become an atheist like that doesn't make any sense like i'm rejecting all the scriptures i'm rejecting rejecting all the gods i'm rejecting the caste system which is like these are the main principal things about hinduism and i'm rejecting all of that and people say well it's your culture i'm like i don't even practice the culture properly i'm more into like cultures of different countries or fusion of different cultures from all around the world i'm not like this specific culture yes i like certain things about this culture like i like the sari for example um there are things i like about the culture but are you muted uh, oh sorry yeah. I was yeah. gonna say the food, Indian food. Yeah. <laughs> it rocks. So there, there are things, but I, I'm not that cultural about India. Like I, I'm not like so much traditional. And then people go about the geographical identity. I'm like, why is it like India? This border, this modern political border. Why is this border considered like this is modern? Like in India, the current Indian border was like became uh, like this in 1947. like even after that actually before because some of the states were not in india and there are like border conflicts and everything so even after that so the modern borders of india that's like very recent so how is this like people in this certain border are india and then they go to like oh no the entirety of south asia is like hindu culture so i'm like okay if you consider the entirety like why like i i usually ask why and they're like oh because like hindu you know the persians gave the term hindu for the people uh beyond the in this river i'm like yes yeah, sure it is beyond the in this river but beyond the in this river would also consider like the entirety of southeast asia from the perspective of persians and if you go far enough it would even consider the, like the united states is also beyond the in this like you can just everything around. that's beyond could be the whole rest of the globe beyond the in this river yeah it, it could be like they themselves could be like from <laughs> if you like persians themselves are beyond the indus if you like go to a, a, through a complete circle like right. so <laughs> what is beyond the indus so you have to fix a limit so why is it the entirety of the subcontinent because people when uh, like back then the hindus were only settled in the northwestern part of india so it would make sense if they say oh the northwestern part of the subcontinent is like that's where the people were hindus because that's where the aryan settlements first began that's where they came through and everything like started there so and then this river was also in the northwestern part of the subcontinent so it makes sense if you say it's only in the northwestern part or even like a uh, part of the northern part but they say the entirety of the subcontinent like why the like greeks gave like the region i am from bengal the greeks gave it a different name the greeks gave it a name of gangaridai they didn't call it hindu or they didn't, didn't even consider them as same as the rest of the indians so should we just consider ourselves the, the religion here is a different religion or something like so i'm not a hindu i'm not, i'm not from northwestern part of in, the subcontinent i'm from the eastern part of the subcontinent so like what is like this no like the only definition that would make sense is like the religious one because the geographical identity has been lost ages ago and the persians did give the name hindu to the beyond the west but they eventually began to spread that makes sense they did spread but the only way they spread is like they made their culture like their religion and the culture they spread through that because 
like they weren't many people to conquer the entirety of it they were like the aryans they were they considered themselves the upper caste and the native indians they were like the lower caste so that was how the caste system got in it was kind of racism because they were like the native indian tribes they were considered as slaves so they would be in the lower castes so that they just spread their culture and the caste system and that's how the religion that's how like they spread their culture so i mean that's not even indian culture that's just the culture that spread from that particular point so that's not the entire culture of india and that's why we see like a very similar culture but very different still in the subcontinent um however like um the term hinduism like the term hindu did come from the persians however the term hinduism like adding ism to the end as a religion as a name for the religion that was uh, coined by a hindu himself during the colonial era to di- dis- differentiate hindus from muslims and christians mm-hmm. so you are already so but i reject this identity completely so how am i still a hindu and but you just want to hold me as like oh no you are still a hindu like i'm not i reject everything about this identity you know so this is where it gets so funky for me because i reject the entirety of the religion but it's difficult for me because so much of who i am and how i perceive things and you know growing up in a household that spoke the Jew- a jewish language and then also a lot of this is put on me by the outside world you know so i because of my name people make assumptions about me all the time some of them are correct <laughs> but that you know i was born jewish my parents were jewish but um there's also a level of it and this came up in david's talk the the antisemitism the um the rejection of calling yourself a jew on some people were talking about this in terms of you have a responsibility to all the people who were murdered for being jewish to you know to live and to be jew be a jew so this was a discussion that you know came up with a lot of people and this is what i mean by it broke people you know because there's i understand what they're saying you know and and david's response was and this is also you know intellectually rational well you know you don't have to say i'm a jew you could say you know i come from jewish descent my parents were you know religious jews that kind of thing but it's difficult when you're up against the that you know prejudice and um ibrahim Abdullah from Muslimish made a statement that I I kind of agree with at least for myself personally. So when I'm amongst Jews, especially religious ones, I'm not Jewish in terms of religiosity. But when I'm faced with anti-Semites who are going to be prejudiced against me regardless of whether I'm a believer or not, then i'm jewish because i have to stand with these other people who have absolutely a right to believe whatever they want to believe practice whatever they want to practice and so ibrahim when made that uh statement about you know being muslim you know he's an ex muslim but he's also has feels like if muslims are being um discriminated against then based on his name and and how he grew up then he he's a muslim so i i understand that too and it's this weird kind of um dichotomy for me you know and also i think in a way it's a little bit easier for jews particularly american jews even to not believe in god to be atheist and to be open about it and no one not as many people have an issue i mean there was a a poll from uh 2013 uh i remember this in, at that time they're saying one in five american ethnically jewish people are atheists one in five in the united states that's pretty big compared to you know and um it's it's not an issue so much particularly in the united states 
even amongst your family who might be religious, you know, um, there's a scene in this film on Netflix. It's called One of Us, which I recommend if anybody has Netflix to see. It's about three people who leave this very extreme Jewish sect. And uh, there's a scene in there where one of the young men, um, who's a personal friend of mine, actually, he's his name's Ari. He's questioning and he stopped wearing the payas, the curls. And he's not wearing the same kind of clothes, but he's still in the community. He's, you know, working his way out. He's, you know, piece by piece stopping. And so in this scene, he um, is discussing with this rabbi his situation. And this very old rabbi, you know, with the beard and the curls and, the, you know, says to him, so you have questions. You know, he's got this Eastern European accent. And he says, yes, you know, I have all these questions about, you know, these rules and, and, and the nature of the religion. And he's like, so you're wondering, does God exist or not? And he's like, yes, yeah, does he? And he's like, who cares? If God exists, he doesn't exist. The important thing is that you follow the rules, that you do what your family says. So I found that to be so interesting and it made me laugh because it was very Jewish. But this guy who is a clergyman and, you know, a very respected figure, everyone's looking to him for answers. You know, he's telling people what to do, what not to do, is telling this young kid like, it doesn't matter whether you believe in God, whether God exists or not. What's important is you're doing, you know, the what your parents say, you're following the rules, you're not going against the community. And I thought, oh, you know, that's so interesting because maybe this guy doesn't even, you know, I, it, it, I just found it so interesting that you could even have a clergyman say it doesn't matter. What matters is the rules the covenant, the contract. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, a lot of my relatives said as well, like, you need to follow this, like our ancestors have been doing this. We have been doing, following these rules for generations. And I'm like, yeah, so that we have been following lots of rules for, like people say, like, if these are really bad rules, would you have uh, so many people for so many years, would they have followed this? I'm like, you do realize like people used to burn widows on their husband's fire in Hinduism. Like mm -hmm. that was also followed for generations. And that was like opposed when the people, liberal Hindus or the reformers, they tried to ban that practice. They were opposed by lots of Orthodox Hindus. Mm -hmm. uh, but now it's banned and no one really, people will think, oh, this was something crazy. I'm like, but that was Hinduism. So yeah, people don't see that sort of reformation <laughs> happening when they're in the middle yeah, of it. And then once they're on the other side of it, they just see, think that, Oh, this is the way it's always been because this yeah. is where it is in my life. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think, I think you're right that, you know, this idea of, you know, and specifically what we were mentioning about when people have children, you know, and so in Judaism, the big covenant between Abraham and God is the circumcision. And um, so I know plenty of people who are were raised Jewish, Jews, you know, who don't believe in God, atheists, Jews, Jews who, you know, just go to synagogue, you know, because their mom wants them to on Yom Kippur or whatever, don't care about any of it, eat pork, whatever, even marry non-Jews, whatever. But they have a boy. They it's some weird thing that's been sort of implanted in them almost that they have to circumcise this kid so because they have to physically mark this boy as a Jew. Now, granted, in the United States, lots of people circumcise now. I don't know why it's just being ubiquitous. Yeah. But if you're raised Jewish, this is a physical mark you have to cut away a piece of this child's body to stamp this religiosity on him. And it's, I just, I don't understand, especially the people who aren't believers. You know, I don't think it's a 
good practice at all. I think it's barbaric and it's mutilation, even if you're a believer. But if you're a believer, at least you're a believer. So you're going to, you know, believers do lots of things that don't make sense. But people who are non-believers that I, I personally know, very many atheists, raised Jewish atheists, they will circumcise their sons, you know, and I was preparing for a fight with my mother. Should I have a boy? You know, because I wasn't going to circumcise him and I knew it would be the like she would say, you stabbed me in the heart. Why don't you just kill me already? You know that I mean, it would have just been I mean. She knew I didn't believe in God. She knew I was eating, you know, I wasn't keeping kosher. She, you know, all of these things, but not circumcising. You know, I even had a backup plan that I might name the kid, if it was a boy, Israel or Judah, to kind of massage her, you know, because I wouldn't circumcise. Luckily, I didn't have to make that, uh, didn't have to have that conversation, but it's so strange like what you were saying this tradition it's just baggage that old people gave you to carry yes i, I don't people. remember i, I don't yeah. know exactly who said this but this also this meme going around recently but this has been like uh, there for a long time like tradition is just peer pressure from dead people so. yeah i think it might have been <laughs> doug stanhope maybe that could be I, I yeah I it's exactly what it is yeah, you know, like who and, the fuck is? I mean, if you do enjoy the traditions, then just enjoy any tradition you want to, like not just the tradition of your ancestor. If you don't like it, don't uh, practice these traditions. If mm -hmm. you like some other tradition, practice that tradition. Because if you just uh, like these traditions, and because we already rejected lots of parts of these traditions as we progressed, as humanity has progressed, but. Mm -hmm. There are some things like which are being forced to practice for uh, children, and I think that's dumb. And yeah, I mean it. I you know uh, I I think it's a it's a terrible thing to do to a child, you know, um, a terrible thing, uh, a little boy, and it's just it's it's really it's barbaric, and it's a remnant of this barbaric age you know and it to me it's like the the god of uh abraham saying you know i need a blood sacrifice from you and there's a passage in the in the uh story in the torah where um moses has a wife her name's zipporah and she wasn't um from uh the tribe the, you know the israelites or the canine she's she wasn't but uh She's, you know, kind of following along. She's so there's the scene where they're traveling and Moses hasn't they haven't circumcised his son yet. And it's past eight days, which is when you have to circumcise uh, in Judaism, which, by the way, is because the clotting mechanism, the clotting uh, mechanism in your blood, in the child's blood doesn't really get up to speed. I'm, I'm really kind of making this layman, but that's basically it. You don't have those clotting factors until at least about eight days minimum. So probably what that means is in the beginning, they were circumcising newborn babies right away and the kids were dying and people, boys still do die from it, by the way. So they're like, oh, well, you know, so-and-so waited eight days and their kid didn't die. Okay. God says it's eight days. You know, but Zipporah hadn't circumcised their son. And so they're traveling and there's a scene that God kind of comes to Moses and he's fighting him, beating him up sort of and throwing him around the tent and uh, be about this not circumcising and he's not following the rules and I'm leaving out a lot of it, but that's basically the whole thing. So God's, you know, this force and Moses is getting beat up and thrown around the tent. So Zipporah grabs a sharp stone and she cuts the foreskin off their son and she throws it in God's general direction. And she says, and this always stayed with me. And this is the reason why I'm bringing this up. She said, what a bro 
bridegroom of blood thou art to me. So her husband is this bridegroom of blood, but yet God is. This God wants a blood sacrifice to prove you're on his team. You know, and and in this passage, Zipporah says it, you know, that he's there. He's a bridegroom of blood. Moses is because she, he expects it. But so is his God. And I just I remember as a kid learning that and just finding it abhorrent. And also, what kind of God is this that that demands blood sacrifice? The same thing with the, the sacrifice of Isaac. I got in trouble because the rabbi was talking about the sac. You know, God asked him to Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, and at the last minute, he oh no no no, he stays his hand, and so everybody, you know, what kind of you know why would God do this? Okay, this is a question the rabbi's prepared for. That's a normal question he's expecting. That's okay, but what I said is, well. That's terrible. Why doesn't Abraham just get a different God? And I got slapped and they called my parents to say, we have a problem. Because there's the, there's the thing. It's okay if you think God shouldn't have done that or it's why would he do that. But to suggest that you could just get a different God that's not going to ask you to do these things was beyond the pale. He's our God and these are the rules. And because you were born into this chosen people, you don't get a chance. You don't get to get a different God. You can reject this one, but you can't get a different one. Yeah, that's... You know? Well, uh, first of all, like, uh, about everything, like, circumcision is certainly inhuman, and I think it should be banned everywhere. <laughs> so, I... Like, it's it's weird that that's even need, that even needs to be said. Like, You'd think that people would just have the common sense to think like this is evil, uh, but apparently not. So just that's the fucking. And it dumb might have and made sense six thousand years ago in the desert when you're you know roaming around the desert and you don't have access to water and you're wearing long robes and you're getting sand up in the foreskin. Okay, maybe that might have yeah. made more sense, but. Yeah, I mean, that's the problem now. with religion because religion keeps the traditions from like 6,000 years ago. Yeah, I Some mean, reasons. in the Jewish calendar, it's 5781. I, yeah. So, come on. Like, that's 5,781 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's so freaking dumb but yes i that's uh, i mean i agree with that but i wanted to ask you like do you ever get frustrated about like uh being jewish is like the ethnicity and the religion like they don't have separate terms for that yeah it it's it's sometimes hard to explain or to um make it apparent but mostly it's to non-jews to Jews or ethnic Jews or religious Jews, they don't see this. They're like, oh, you're a Jew who doesn't believe in God. Whatever. Move on. You know? Yeah. But, and that's how they see it. Oh, you're a Jew. There's nothing you can do about it. Because some people, like I know Armin says this all the time, that Jews are a race. We're not a race. Okay? Jews are not a race. I mean, like, in- the race would be Semites. Well, yeah, but that's not even a race either. That's a a language group, and it has DNA markers from this particular region in the world. And the, you know, Semitic language, and they give this name to the people who speak this Semitic language from this region as Semites. And Jews fit that because we did form this tribe, so to speak, in the Levant you know, 6,000 years ago. Um, But that isn't necessarily a race. You can have Semitic markers and be, you know, Chinese. Or, you know, you can... 
And so the same thing, for example, the thing where it gets weird is Ashkenazi Jews, which are European Jews, which is what I mostly am. I'm like, my brother did the DNA test, like 97% and 3% North African or something. Um, we do have specific DNA markers. So you can set, so like a person from Yemen a, a Jew from Yemen and a Muslim from Yemen are going to have basically the same Semitic markers. But a Jew from Lithuania is going to have those same Semitic markers as those, the Jew and the Muslim from Yemen and markers as non-Jewish or Europeans and then a special one. So you can tell because we were bottlenecked in the Caucasus mountains, you know, a long time ago. And, but yeah, it's, it, it does, it's hard to differentiate for me when I'm talking to people who are, weren't raised in the Jewish tradition that it, you know, when I say, well, you know, I reject it. Yeah, but you're still Jewish, right? Well, ethnically. Yeah. Culturally. Yeah. You know, if you ask my parents, yes, they didn't care, you know, and I've had Jews tell me that, but yeah, there isn't a separate word, you know, but then I think Muslims have a similar, you know, thing because you have a Muslim culture that's religious, which is different from the culture of the country that you're from. And the same thing as I was talking about with Jews, there's a religious culture that, you know, everybody knows that this is the prayer you say for the dead or everybody knows that, you know, it's Shabbat, no lights, but the culture of Jews in Tunisia is completely different in a lot of ways, the national culture yeah. than the Jews in Portugal or wherever. Yeah. So yeah, it, it, it is kind of frustrating to have to go, well, wait a minute, let me explain and go through all these steps. But then also um, the other thing that uh, is part of this equation is that it doesn't matter to bigots and anti-Semites whether you are a believer or not a believer. You're still someone that they don't like because your name, your, uh, you know, cultural association, yeah. your blood, your, you know, whatever. So in that case, like Ibrahim was saying, you know, well, then I guess I'm a Jew if you're going to, you know, hate somebody for no other reason than I feel, okay, I have this responsibility to all the people in my family who died, were murdered, you know, because of that identifying factor or your name or how you dress or the language, you know, and yeah. the name thing, you know, it really, when you're talking about anti-Semitism, so anybody who's on social media and has sort of a presence and talks and, you know, a, you know, pontificates or gives opinions on things can sometimes get, you know, messages that aren't very nice from anonymous people. I mean, everybody uh -huh. in the internet's anonymous, but specifically people that you don't even know, or you don't know where this is coming from. For me, every single one of those messages I have ever, ever gotten are anti-Semitic. Sometimes they throw a little sexual violence in there to spice it up, but every single one, and it doesn't even have to be that I'm talking about religion or politics. I could be on a page saying, oh, this cat is really cute. And someone who sees my name sees my comment and I get this me this hate message and it, they're all anti-Semitic. So yeah, it's, it's hard to explain, but then for a lot of people, it doesn't matter, you know, which I think, you know, a lot of people who are in minorities understand. You know, people don't yeah. care a lot of times because they're haters and they hate you regardless of, you know, how you identify or not. Yeah, I mean, I get that um, because like they don't like they it's not even like the discrimination of religion. Technically, it's just 
your discrimination based on your ancestry so so mm-hmm. th- because but i think that would still uh, be kind of a frustration because you can still have like a different term for religion and the culture or mm-hmm. the ethnicity and be like oh these people are bigoted against the ethnicity not the religion maybe uh, but i i got saved in that sense because i don't have to use the word hindu i just say indian or like to foreigners i say indian or in india if they ask my specific ethnicity i just say bengali so mm-hmm. because that's my specific ethnicity in india uh, yeah so I, i don't have to say hindu so that's where i'm saved what most sense. people who are ethnically or culturally jewish is they just say oh i'm ethnically jewish i yeah. don't practice i'm ethnically jewish or you know that's what most people like that's sort of the the standard oh i don't practice or i'm non practicing or i'm not religious i'm just ethnically jewish and that could yeah. be ethnically jewish from whatever country you're in your nationality so for me you know i'm american was born in the united states so if someone says you know what are you the first thing you know what like, you know basically i'll say well i'm american you know but americans love to know like where you know who you are you know what are you yeah that's indians and indians also like so they <laughs> want to know like well oh you know oh my and because we're you know a nation of immigrants everybody's got some story you know the irish or lithuanian or polish or portuguese or whatever you know vietnamese so Americans are really interestingly and weirdly in some way obsessed with knowing that, you know, where are you from? Well, I'm from here. Yeah, but where are you from? You know, particularly if you have any yeah. kind of an accent or a different kind of name. So, um but yeah, if somebody pushes me on, you know, I can say, you know, Polish and Moroccan and Romanian, but Well yeah, but okay, I'm ethnically Jew, you know. And sometimes I deliberately don't do it to force them to ask. And I I remember I was working I was working at this one uh grocery store and I was in the in the back room, you know, stocking next to this woman I had been working with for a year and a half or something. And she said I made some joke about, you know, growing up Jew, you know, Jews or Jew and she's like, "You're you're Jewish?" And I said, "Yeah, you know, my name, you know, like you see my name tag first and last, you know, that hasn't clued you in." And she said, "Oh, well, I didn't know." And then she says, "You don't act Jew." And then she stopped. She was going to say, "You know, you don't act Jewish." And I'm like, "Well, how do Jews act?" And she's like, "Well, um not like you and i'm like but you're not answering my question you know and what's the joke is that some jews would be like oh thanks you know you just gave me a compliment no one knows you know but but also you know like what are you saying like all of a sudden when she realized that i had this jewish name and i grew up jewish then i'm a jew and then i'm supposed to act a certain way You know, I wanted to say yeah. what I'm not rich, is that what you're saying, you know, or like you know, because people have said that to me, "Oh, you're Jewish, give me some money." Or, you know, "How come you're not rich?" or you know, or assume that you're rich or that, you know, that's always a the big a big one or, you know, control everything and so, yeah, I I just remember that, you know, you don't act ju- and she stops herself you know cuz she can hear her so you know yeah it's yeah, that's kind of, yeah i know that because even in india people are like what are you like and in india like people know like most people understand by the name by your name where you are from by your surname specifically so mm-hmm. because different regions have like this particular sets of surnames as well mm-hmm. so people would know from that but Uh, once i get my legal documents then it would be really hard to know where i'm from <laughs> right <laughs> because my name's like very different like my name has a story behind it <laughs> yeah mean, and yeah. so what you were saying about the surname so the uh, first name yeah. like people who weren't raised mm-hmm. jewish might not get the first name but yeah. everyone's going to know the last name 
you know? It's a stereotypical Jewish last name. Yeah. I mean, I, I, the only reason I even know, like, the Indian ones is because, like, I've just seen people using them growing up. Even then, I didn't know, like, as a kid, I didn't know, like, how are these people, like, just recognizing, like, how do they know, like, this surname is from this region? I'm like, how the hell do people even know and why is it even important? Like, they're living I, here right now. I found myself occasionally, even as an adult, like, I'll meet somebody and their last name will be something and I'll think, oh, that's a Jewish last name. And when they're not, I'll be like, what? You know, uh, you know, like, because I, I, and so this is when you see that it's hard to get past these things and that you even do it yourself. So I'm, I meet someone, they say their last name is this, and I've made an assumption because I think that's a Jewish last name. Or I meet a Gentile and they have a name that's, you know, very, you know, a Hebrew name or something. So I'll go two ways. Oh, they're either Jewish or they're evangelical Christian. You know, if you, I yeah. would meet a Rebecca who spells it K-K-A-H, you know, R-E-B, then, okay, even. So these are assumptions that people just make and you catch yourself doing it. And you're like, so then you think, oh, this person's like this or this person's like that. And I know about this person or what I think I know about this person and how they're going to believe and what they think. And, you know, because my name is Rebecca too. Rivka means Rebecca, you know. Which is interesting because that the Hebrew that um, you used, it doesn't necessarily mean apostate, but I chose it because it means like loose or liberated or, you know, and because um, that's kind of how I feel about it. You know, like I've been let loose from this control or I've been liberated from this. But Rivka, Rebecca means to bind. Could also mean to bind in friendship, but it means to bind. So it's symbolic for me to have a name that kind of means to bind because you're bound by these rules and these traditions yeah. and these laws, but then you can use a word to describe yourself as leaving all this. It's, it's just, for me, it's very symbolic meaning to be let loose when your name means to bind. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, uh, the names of people, I think the names also say a lot about the religiosity of your parents. Like, do Jewish, like, people, if they're not very religious, would they name their kids in a very religious way? Like, for, for Hindus, for example, like, religious people will name their kids, like, something like some name of a god or something like that. Mm -hmm. But not, like, I mean, conservative maybe, but not very, like, religious but not like that level of religious they will just name their kids whatever they like for example my name uh, means the ultimate good my birth name means the ultimate good in Bengali, Ooh, that's yeah. a nice name nice meaning i mean yeah but that has no religious uh, connotation like whatsoever not and um, i mean not that i know of and that's not at all religious that's more of a modern indian name that many people from my generation have many kids from my generation have so well to answer your question a lot of it depends on the country that you live in so for example um i actually have an american name too that my mother would say use this name you know in so my last name is a giveaway but so kids wouldn't hear the different name and they oh you it was important because they're immigrants and you know but um in america a lot of jews if they're not religious will give their kid an american name and a hebrew name so your hebrew name is what you would use for your bat mitzvah or bar mitzvah for a boy uh on the ketubah which is the wedding contract um in any you know synagogue related documents or any you know ceremonies things like that and that's what you know your name in israel shall be they say this is what you are in israel so but in israel most of the people a lot of them have religious sounding names or bible names but that's just more of the culture you know some of them could be really minor characters in the bible that sometimes I've had to look up, like, I think I know, you know, oh, who, where did this guy, you know? 
And then some are not necessarily, they're just names from that part of the world. Um, again, you know, um, some of my ancestors in Europe had a name, uh, uh, a more uh, secular version of their name, you know? So my great grandfather Shmuel, but that's Samuel. So when he came to, um, they came to the United States, they call, Oh, I'm Sam. It's just easier for everyone to call him Sam than Shmuel, you know, or um, Moshe, you know, Moses, you know, like, so, there's this, especially in the United States because of the immigrant nature, you know, but yeah, a, um, a lot of people who are not religious just give their kid a Hebrew name for the purposes of the religious portion of their life, how that's going to go, you know, and, and they name after people who have died. So there's no juniors, you know, the person has to die. And then you pick someone that you're naming after, you know, grandparent or whomever, great grandparent, but only after dead people. Yeah, I get it. Um, should we? Let's take some you, questions. If yeah, there are any. that was that was uh, what I was about to ask. Like, should we take live chat questions now? Yeah. Okay, sure. So yeah. So people in the live chat can ask their questions and I'll just scroll up and see. I think some people asked like questions already. So I'll just be highlighting those for now until we get more questions. Okay. Uh, let's see. This person's asking, how do you know there's nothing beyond the physical universe? I don't. <laughs> I but, mean. But based on what I've been seeing, you know, that's the way I'm going to bet. Yeah. I mean, we don't have any, like, there's no reason to believe there is something beyond the physical universe because we don't have any evidence for that. Like, we don't know if there are, like, um, Martians right now, mm -hmm. like, people in Mars, because, like, we don't have any evidence. So we believe no one lives in Mars but or any of the other planets in the solar system. But how do we know there aren't any? Like they right. could be just you hiding for all we know. Like, you can't know everything there is to know. And so, yeah. you know, some people will say, oh, you say you're an atheist. You don't, there's no, how do you know there's no God? You know, I'm like, well, I don't. But based on everything I've seen so far and the lack of evidence that I've seen, you know, that's, but I mean, if you pushed me into a corner, painted me into a corner, I would have to say, I don't know because I don't. I can't prove it to you. I don't a hundred percent know, you know, but Neil deGrasse Tyson has a really good um, commentary on this. He says, you know, God is just an ever receding pocket of scientific ignorance. So, you know, but if there's evidence, if I can see evidence of this and it happens, okay, fine. But no, I don't know. I can't know everything. That's an irrational position to take to say that you absolutely know everything there is to know. Yeah, I agree. Um, and then Dolly is asking, I think it should be, are there, I guess, are there Jews who kill ex-Jews, same as Muslims? Um, not so much, but I do know, and this actually happened to me, I mean, they're shunning, you know, there's just, mean treatment, you know, they, if you leave a very religious, um, sect, they, you know, may make sure you don't get to see your kids. They may, you know, make sure you don't get custody of your kids that you can't talk to anybody, you know, so a lot of just emotional, uh, and mental abuse, but I will tell you, and this has happened to me before, there are some very, very religious Jewish neighborhoods that'll have signs that say, you know, this is a religious neighborhood, please respect our modesty, or don't wear these kind of clothes here. And I actually had some stones thrown at me in a very religious neighborhood in Israel once. I was wearing, I wasn't, I don't dress very provocatively, but I was wearing a, a dress that uh, didn't have any sleeves. Because it was like, August, you know, in the Middle East or something. And uh, I, you know, 
I don't, I can't read Hebrew because I'm a Hebrew school dropout. I knew what the sign said just because I know that it was something to that effect. But, um, some, you know, they yelled at me and threw stones, you know, um, but, and I should have listened to my friend Simka who said, don't go through that neighborhood. They're jerks. Go around, even though it takes like 20 minutes longer. And I'm like, whatever. <laughs> and part of that is being American, right? Like Americans are just like, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And you're not going to, you know, I mean, and even though I, I don't necessarily come think that in my head, I think there's a level of that being American. I'm like, I don't have to listen to your rules. I'm not, you know, so, um, but so that does happen, you know, and um, yeah, and the same in any like religious um, or, you know, closed group, you get, you know, people who individually are terrible to other people, but I don't, it's not a commandment type thing that you have to kill them. And I, you know, it's not something I really hear about the, the, the shunning the nastiness, the emotional and verbal abuse, you know, um, mental abuse. Yeah. You know, not letting you see your children ever. Those kind of things. Yes. And Dolly again, um, can I ask Rifa what she thinks about the political Israel situations? What's going oh. on now or just en general? Yeah, I think I think so, she means now because people are like talking about now, but you can yeah, say about the general thing as well. Well, I mean, let me start off by saying, you know, Israelis and Palestinians both have the right to live in peace and security. Um, I, you know, I'm a two-state solution person. Um, for me personally. I'm a Zionist to the extent that I say it means self-determination for people, Jewish people or ethnically Jewish people. Um, and the, um, but in terms of the, um, the government there, the right leaning nature of the country compared to when I was younger, um, I'm, I don't uh, support that mindset. I don't like some of the um, racism and the things that I've heard and have been hearing from a lot of these uh, very extremist Jews. And I actually have a theory on this, particularly about the settlements, because this sort of relates to some of what's going on now. This is my personal theory. So I think part of the reason that you see some of this very extreme stuff coming out of the settlements and the talk about, you know, Judea and Samaria and the Mashiach when the Messiah comes and, you know, what's going to happen then and all this sort of almost Christian type end times discussion. I think it's because a lot of those people in the settlements are American. Not all, okay, but a lot of them are. And if you're American, and we were talking about what you were talking about, the the sort of social religiosity that people have, you know, like you might call yourself a Hindu because everybody else does, or you might call yourself a Christian in the United States because people are Christian, you know, and yeah, I have a Christmas tree. So even if you're Jewish, right, and you don't call yourself a Christian and you lived a Jewish life, you grew up in this country with this socialization of a lot of these Christian narratives, which end times, Israel, God coming back, you know, all of this stuff is sort of part of this cultural uh, consciousness or cultural things that you learn you know, enculturated with in the United States. And then also the sort of frontier, bang, bang, shoot them up, cowboy, shoot first, ask questions later. Very also a, a social American kind of narrative, especially in movies and books. And kind of some of us, some Americans think of themselves that way even. So you take these people and you transplant them to Israel 
and then the religiosity because you're in this small group and all extremists have these things in common. There's isolation. They have, you know, um, specific, you know, scriptures that can't be challenged or ideas that can't be challenged. You know, the, um, the us versus them in group, out group mindset. So you put all of that together there. It, a lot of it translates into some of what I think you're seeing in the settlements. Now, what do I think about it now? I think that, you know, as I stated before, you know, both Israelis and Palestinians have the right to live in peace and security. I think Israel has the right to defend itself. But I also think that the status quo in terms of how the Palestinian situation is kind of serves a lot of the um, the status quo serves a lot of people's uh, agendas, you know, on both sides. And um, I would like to see the escalation, you know, come down. I don't like the rhetoric. I don't, I absolutely don't like the rhetoric from Hamas. They're a terrorist group. They, you know, the, their charter specifically states you know, their uh, animus towards Jews and the state of Israel. But also there's a lot of really bigoted, nasty rhetoric coming from the Netanyahu government and some of these extreme, you know, rah-rah Zionist in terms of ethno-nationality, not necessarily Zionist in terms of the right to have self-determination people. And I would like to see that and, but I think part of the issue in Israel too is a lot of these extreme religious groups, the Haredim, the very, very ultra Orthodox, have a lot more sway with the government than others, even though they may not be such a large part of the population. But they, there's a lot of like playing to the base. And, um, you know, I, I hope that this situation doesn't escalate into all out, you know, bloodbath. I mean, I really do. Yep. Um, so moving on to next is Dolly again. Is the Torah, is the Talmud? I mean, she's asking if both are the same. Well, there's um, the Mishnah, the Talmud, the Torah. The, um, the Talmud is like the amalgamation of all the commentary and the Torah, right? And so, as I stated before, there's all this um, commentary that goes along with all these books. It's the collection, the Talmud, so is this collection of writings that are, you know, the commentary and the laws and some of the theology, but um, it's a body of Jewish law, ceremonial law, and it's um, there's several different versions mm -hmm. of it, but it's a lot of this commentary in the writings. But the Torah is the Bible, what people would refer to as the Old Testament, you know, Genesis um, uh, onward, you know, and so there's no the New Testament books like Mar Mark and Luke and John, all those, no, we just have Genesis, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, you know, Exodus, all of those. That's so that's the Torah. If you think about it as the old Testament. Yeah. I mean, okay. So here's the thing. I mean, there were other books that were not included in the Bible canon. So are there like Jewish, do Jewish people like believe in those? Like, like I think they, uh, I don't remember the exact name, but there are other books like the Book of Genesis, the Book of Exodus, like these books that comprise the Old Testament. But there are certain books that didn't make the final Bible canon. Yeah, uh, you know, I know more about the ones in the New Testament, like the Gnostic Gospels and the Book of Mary and things like that. You know, I'm not a hundred percent sure on that because I kind of blocked a lot of the some I got to a point 
when I would go, we went to Sunday school because Saturday was Shabbat. So you weren't going to go anywhere. So we went on Sunday and I just remember blocking a lot of that out, you know, um, and just would be, you know, like this when they would talk and talk. Although I, so I, I, I know a lot of the old Testament stories because I had this big book and my mother would read it to me every night. But, you know, I don't a hundred percent know, but then there's all these other elements like, you know, of Judaism that use numerology. So that's Kabbalah, you know, and that's this mystical and that's, so I, I can't tell you exactly because I don't really know. Yeah. I mean, for example, here's this book, the book of Jubilees or the lesser Genesis, for example, and it's Wikipedia says it's an ancient Jewish religious work considered canonical by the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. So it's like a particular sect. Considered well, sister. those Ethiopian Jews are some of very, very old, um, you know, um, I wouldn't say like some of the oldest Christians around, some of the oldest Jews. But so I don't 100 percent know because um. What I know is what I was taught and I didn't delve into it any further. And then also remember, I was taught the Eastern European sort of not 100 percent Hasidic, but we had some Hasids in our family, you know, Litvaks, which are so Jews in Eastern Europe are divided into Litvox and Galicianas. We were Litvox. We were from this part of the country. We spoke Yiddish. We did this. We, you know, we don't cook sweet. They cook sweet. We don't do this. They, so I was only taught that. And then also a lot of what I knew about Judaism was filtered through my mother's interpretations. So I can't answer that question. You'd have to ask somebody who's a better scholar than me. Yeah, that's fine. Um, and there are more questions. I think there are some down there. Uh, David is saying this doesn't apply to you, Rivka, but I've come across atheist Jews that act like Hindu atheists, if you understand the reference. I think it means like those Hindu atheists, like they say, oh, all religions are false, but Hinduism is not a religion. These gods, they're like, no, these are real. These are not supernatural, something like that. It's a way of life. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> Perhaps, but most of the people I know that I run across who are atheist Jews are atheists in that they reject a God belief, but they consider themselves Jews ethnically, culturally. And there's a whole other sect of people who belong to the Society for Secular Humanistic Judaism. So it's people who were raised Jews who like the tradition and the songs and the community, but they're not believers in terms of a deity. So they kind of rewrite a lot of these prayers to be secular. So it's a whole atheist synagogue, if you will, you know, Society for Secular Humanistic Judaism. But yeah, I've run across some people who assume that it it's just a lifestyle and whether you believe in God, it doesn't matter. You're still a Jew. If your mother was a Jew, you're a Jew and there's nothing you can do about it, which is kind of similar to some people who call themselves Hindu atheists. And they're like, yeah, yeah. I reject this, but there's nothing you can do. You're still a Hindu because you were born in this country and we're a Hindu country and your parents were Hindu. Yeah. So, yeah. It, so if that is what David is, you know, referring to, then yes, I have run across that. But yeah. again, you know, saying you're an atheist in Judaism doesn't have as much of a negative connotation to a lot of people. It's not the same thing. I just it doesn't have at least in my experience and in the experience of a lot of other people. It's so like, eh, whatever. You know. I mean, I think I would differentiate is like uh, not in Judaism, but um, among Jews, they don't really consider atheism. It's like they are like meh, okay. Uh, exactly. But in Judaism, I would mean like oh, what does the yeah. scripture no, no, say no, about no, atheism? No, 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 no. Like so, there's a Hebrew, there's a Hebrew word for someone who leaves religion. I wish I could remember how to pronounce it. Um, 
and it's the actual what would be considered the correct word for an apostate. And it means like someone who's perverse or, you know, something yeah. wrong with them. So there's like a pejorative nature to it. Absolutely. Pejorative. Yeah. And yeah, that that's... that if you are these very religious people, if your children leave, it's this terrible thing because – You've shown them this right path, and how could they reject it? What What's going to happen to them now? You know, how are they going to be a good person? Yep. Yeah, I, I get that. Like, that's like in Hinduism as well. Like, Hindus, regular Hindus, they don't really care if you're an atheist. Like, they'll just say, oh, you are still a Hindu. You don't believe in God. Like, some Hindus, like, I think most Hindus, like, think you are, like, spiritually or morally immature, to say that you don't believe in a God, but they won't like, oh, you're an atheist, like this is a great scene or something really bad is happening. They're like, ah, yeah, okay. You're just immature. Once you will, one day you will grow up and know the truth and everything. Like some Hindus act like this, but in Hinduism, like there's a specific hill dedicated to atheists or people who uh, like don't like disregard the Vedas as of divine authority and things like that. So. There are things about atheists like in Hinduism, which is. Yeah, you know, um, my growing up, even though uh, my mother became less religious the older I got because we moved all the time and it was a lot of work to have to have two refrigerators, two sets of pots and paint, you know, all this stuff. And um, But my sense of it, oh gosh, now I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, oh, about, um, and and this is the, what I took away from what I did learn is it's about what you do here, not about what you are, your afterlife. And so much so that a lot of people, and I always thought this, we don't even believe in heaven and hell. That's not important. What's important is your acts now, right? How you act now, which is why it's so important that you follow the rules and you do what you're supposed to do because that's what's important. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, um, I have kind of an idea about too, why atheism is kind of like, meh. so if you have this people that were, that went out into the diaspora, you know, and got, when they got kicked out of the temple in Israel, the zealots, and they kicked them out and then they spread out all over the world into this diaspora. So you don't have this physical land, right. To, to think about your, you know, where your religion resides. Okay. And you kind of are everywhere and you have this kind of closed community so you can keep it going and you kind of carry this religion and this idea kind of in your head and your heart within your community. And you're waiting for the Messiah and you're waiting and you're waiting and you've been kicked around from country to country and you're so, well, it's not such a far step to say, well, we've been waiting for 5,000 years. We, all these things, bad things have happened to us. And, well, maybe he's never coming, right? It's not such a far step, especially if you come from a questioning, debating society, right? And so once you start thinking, well, maybe he's not going to come, it's not very much of a further leap to say, well, maybe he does, the reason he doesn't come is because he doesn't exist, you know? Like, I, and I don't know. I mean, there, there may be no basis in this at all, at all, but that's just sort of how I think about it when people just don't seem to really, it's not such a big deal. Now, granted, if you come from a very, very religious family, yeah, it's a big deal. But not the regular people. Like, they're like, whatever. Yeah, I, I mean, Especially the Americans. Think... Almost every American Jew that I, you know, intellectually engage with most of them aren't really believers yeah maybe they you know go to the high holidays with their mom or whatever but yeah there's a huge I mean, percentage yeah. of american jews that are we're one of the least religious religious groups yeah i mean i think atheism is increasing very fast here in the u.s so. and, and everywhere actually yeah, I mean, everywhere, but like very fast. I mean, it's growing everywhere, but like in the US, I think it's very fast because like 
or i mean in everywhere even i think we can say everywhere they just don't come out because of like the social pressure and the governmental well, they they're laws not le- or they're not legally pr- they don't have the legal protection and yeah. regardless of what everybody says this is a secular country we you know it, we have a document that says yeah. you know I mean, it is yeah i mean even in india like i like if i have to like like in some, there are several official and legal documents like in india where you need to mention your religion like even in my school i had to put my religion in the school form so i'm like there's no option for atheist or religious so i have mm. to put hindu in there so the count of atheists in india is also like they cannot determine how many atheists there are because there's no way to know exactly right the- and I think in the United States, you know, they do a lot of polls and in the yeah. se- and sometimes in yeah. other things and they say like the nuns like I have no religion. It's like almost 20%. At that point we're like the largest minority in the entire country if you yeah. think about it that way. And you know, I run into that all the time when people want to know my race on all these forums and I always say human and then sometimes yeah. it really messes with people. Like when I went to get the COVID shot, the guy's like, well, you, did, you didn't put anything down for race. And I'm like, okay, human. He's like, I can't type that in. You know, and he was just like losing his mind. I mean, like, that's, there's no, that, there's no, you know. <laughs> I mean, that's the only biologically correct answer because the in biology, the only race is like the human race. Right. Because the race, the other and race I, is weak. <laughs> Yeah, and I told him, I'm like, just write other. And he's like, okay, okay. Like, I had to give him something. He could not <laughs> type in human. He's like, I don't have that option. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Um, next question. Music guy is asking, Rivka, what's the reason of kissing your fingers and touching the doorway? I've seen ah, it, but didn't understand. Mezuzot. Okay, so mezuza is singular, mezuzot is plural. So these are these little boxes that have scripture inside of them. And some are fancy and some are not. But there's the scripture, you shall bind them on the doorposts of your house, okay? And on your head and your hands, that's the the phylacteries, the tefillin boxes, right? That the men wrap when they pray. Um, So, very religious people and my family did it um some do or some don't but particularly religious people so when you're going out or coming in you mostly it's going out you kiss your fingers because you can't put your lips directly on it but this whole kissing of it a lot of that is a i think very hasidic traditions because my family you also, if you drop a Bible, you have to kiss it. If you drop the yarmulke, you have to kiss it. If you drop the my father's uh, prayer shawl, you have to kiss it. Everything, you know, there's this kissing of it all the time. But the mezuzot, so you, that's from the Bible where it says you bind it on the doorposts of your house. So this is how you identify a Jewish home is by on the door frame outside the door on the right side about three quarters of the way up at an angle you put these little some of them are very very pretty and some of them are just very simple little you know tube or box and inside there are scriptures now i have some that i was given that i um and so a lot of times they sell them too, sometimes without the scripture and you have to pay more. <laughs> They're empty. You buy the scripture and you put it in or, you know, it comes with it. But I took some of the of the ones that I was given, I took the scripture out and then some that my mother gave me that she bought when I bought my house. Um, assuming that I, you know, I don't know, if, you know, the scripture to, I never put those scriptures in and I wrote my own secular ones and I put them inside. And one of them says, you know, if you need to believe in something, start with yourself, Um, you know, several of them. But yeah, so this is the symbol of a Jewish home. And so you would always put it on the door. And when you go in and out, you kiss the mezuzah, you're sort of, you know, acknowledging it, sort of your obedience to this, your um, love for this, your, you know, I don't know exactly where it came from, but that's what that is when you see that. 
I mean, that we we actually have that's interesting because we kind of have a similar tradition in Hinduism. So, for example, as for books, like if we if Hindus like for example, if they touch a book with their leg feet accidentally, they have to do it like this. This kind of a pranam. And uh -huh. while going while going out, like they have a picture, like many Hindu homes, they have a picture of a god or goddess or whatever, and they do like this. So another this is also sort of a, this call acknowledgement, it yeah. Yeah. This acknowledgement so while your... going out, and I remember like when I used to go to school, like in the stairway, the stair hall, um, there was the picture of Kali, and my mom used to say, oh, "Well, do the pranam to her before leaving," and I. At the first, uh, she used to force me because I I uh, don't believe in God ever since like I was out of kindergarten and I didn't mm -hmm. really believe in a God. But uh, she used to force me to do it, and at one point I was like, "What will happen if I don't? Like mm -hmm. nothing's going to happen. I don't think the, she exists anyway." So I was like, I used to like just because you know the Kali portrait of Kali is like the tongue out and things, and yeah. I used to <laughs> yeah, and I used to do like because. I was facing this side. My mom was behind me. She couldn't see what my face was like. So she could see my hands folded from behind, yeah. but she couldn't see my face. So I was like, yeah, as a way of mocking Kali. And I was like, what will happen? And nothing ever happened. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so that was like, that was the first, like my first blasphemous thing that I ever did in life. And that was like in elementary school or something. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, so that's mean, kind of a thing. Like, yeah, I remember like the one time I ate a Slim Jim when I was a kid, and a Slim Jim is like this meat, you know, jerky meat stick that they sell in the United States. Yeah. But it was like the epitome of treif. Treif is the Yiddish word for you know forbidden meat, you know, or the or. So it's like a corpse, you know, in Hebrew, it means a corpse. So it's forbidden meat, right? So, and it's the epitome of it because it's got who, pork and beef, whatever, but it's in this like stick form and it just seemed like, the, you know, the absolute, okay, yeah, there's a cheeseburger and bacon, but then there's a Slim Jim, you know? <laughs> And um, I just remember like, oh, I'm going to do it, you know, because it was the worst and um, there's a writer who grew up in a very, very religious Jewish Hasidic sect. His name's Shalom Auschlander. He wrote a book, which I recommend people to read if they want to learn about some of this. It's called A Foreskin's Lament. And uh, he talks about that, too, about eating a Slim Jim and how it was like the worst, you know, and how he was like going to go for it. But when he found out they made Slim Jims with cheese, he's like, I'm getting it with cheese, too. And then he laid in bed all night waiting to get struck down, you know. And when nothing happened in the morning, he was kind of like, oh, I think this is bullshit. You know, because he's laying there yeah. waiting, you know, like, you you know, and nothing happened. Yep. Well, um, in the live chat, we have a... Coast Bunny, I'm late, was dealing with a bad headache from him. Oh, well, I I'm hope sorry. you get, yeah, I hope you get well soon, Bunny. But I think God is more likely to give you a headache than Satan. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, then we have a question from Music Guy. Could you tell us about your tattoos and what's the view of having tattoos for Jewish people? Most Jewish people don't like them. <laughs> Um, and my mother was very upset. Uh, I didn't have as many when she was alive. I had some, but not as many, um, because they always say, oh, you can't be buried in a Jewish cemetery because, you know, in the Bible, you can't make any marks upon your body. You can't even, if you're Orthodox or, you know, very religious, you can't have pierced ears because your body's a temple. God made this body. You're altering it. You're damaging it. So having pierced ears, no tattoos. And then, of course, there's also this cultural PTSD about the um, the big H, the Holocaust, yeah. you know, and the tattoos there. Um, so it is um, a prohibition in the Bible, and it's not just for Jewish people. I mean, if you're a big, you know, believer in the Bible, and if you're a Christian, that would be the Old Testament and the New Testament. It says it in there, too. Um, but um, 
I've always liked tattoos. I didn't care, you know. So these are, this is a Hebrew tattoo. I don't know if anyone can see it. It's, you know, it looks like okay or ox, but it's just my, um, it's, it's, it's not the correct version of Ema, which is mother in Hebrew, but it's M-A or Ma, you know, that sound, which is yeah. what I call my mother. Um, but I've noticed there's a, a thing that I've seen amongst younger Jewish people, and I've run into it quite a bit in Israel, and I've actually seen Muslim people with this as well, having some word in Arabic or some word in Hebrew tattooed and then i've even seen um some grandparent grandchildren or children of mostly it's grandchildren not so much children of um survivors from the um holocaust have had their grandparents or their relatives number tattooed on them as a way of honoring their survival but it's generally frowned upon although there's a big section of Israel that's very heavily tattooed, you know, more secular, you know, um, I've, there's a, a tattoo shop in um, Jerusalem. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name it Mazooks, I think, or something. They're Coptic Christians. And it's like a, this tattoo shop's been in Jerusalem for, you know, 600 years or something. And they used to tattoo, um, pilgrims when they would come to make a pilgrimage and they would have specific tattoos and they have these stamps. So, and then the Moroccan side of my family, you know, Moroccans tattoo quite a bit. They would put the tattoo here or the tattooage, you know, the signs here, here. So um, for me, I've always liked it. These tattoos are actually kind of buddhist hindu it's a dorjas or varjas yeah and then there's a poppy in the middle because i love uh poppies are my favorite flower but supposedly the dorjas or the varjas when they come together they smash ignorance but i like the look yeah. of it and i like symmetrical yeah. tattoos so but i don't yeah, have I though i have I, one no. tattoo on my uh arm that has the river of the town I live in. So that's actually kind of super significant, but I'm sorry, I interrupted you. You were saying what? No, no. I, I was saying that, yeah, tattoos are like just art. So like, like the art, like anyone can like whatever, like it doesn't have to be. Yeah. And yeah. I do have some that are significant, you know, this Hebrew one, yeah. the one of the river, you know, I have some, but most of them are just yeah. Yeah, and not just that, like you said, like the uh, Dodgers and the Vajas, like the Hindu and Buddhist ones, like even them, like you, because they're like art, you just like the kind of art they have and you just maybe like the concept, you don't have to be even religious to enjoy this. And I say this because like many people think uh, you need to be religious to enjoy the traditions. Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, and, I mean, the idea of smashing ignorance, it to me, very very much yeah. something that I, that I find that I approve of, that I want to be able to do that I think is a, is a good goal, you yeah. know? So. Yeah. Um, then we have David saying, well, I have also come across ex Muslims that are very tribalistic and super anti-Israel and anti-Western. Mm -hmm. I mean, tribalistic people everywhere. I will say, and if you like, this is very thing like if you like people are so tribalistic and they don't even like often don't make arguments based on objective reality so and they like just isolate people who want to who just go against even one of their group uh, mentalities so when people like completely uh, rely on objective reality to make arguments they are often very lonely as like they cannot make friends <laughs> because everyone's so tribal yeah, I think um, tribalism is a really big issue. I think that it's really very often very negative. I mean, there's something in the in, you know, evolutionary psychology, you know, that you see that human beings, you know, form these groups and sometimes it was necessary to know, well, you know, they wear the red headdress, yeah. we wear blue. Okay, they're, you know, you might have needed that, you know, at some point to be able to differentiate and, you know, 
But and and we do do that, and we may not even realize it. Our brains just do it. But I think this allegiance to tribes and tribalism is is it's not healthy. It's not helpful. And I think it's you see it's really tearing a lot of um, societies apart. And I it's sad to me because I had thought you know we were kind of hopefully moving beyond that, but it seems like there's a lot of this people that want to pull the future back into the the past. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I I, I think it's like a useless relic from the past, like from like you know, humans, like humanity's infancy or something. Like it's just a useless relic from that time. Like yeah, there was probably a use for this, but we don't need it anymore. At and least just leave it in the past. And sometimes you can see how people can get, you know, if you're involved in something and you're and and maybe dancing or singing and everybody together and you're all, you know, on the same wavelength and you start to feel good and you have this unity, you know, you can understand maybe how some people want to replicate this idea and feel like they belong somewhere. Yeah. Um we have another question for David. Uh, are heaven and hell as crucial to Judaism as they are to Islam or Christianity? No. Because I think the Old Testament doesn't even introduce heaven and hell like as the, like hell. Heaven was like Eden and well, heaven there are, but like hell was not there. So there's this idea sort of, and it's so esoteric that uh, we never even talked about it or very rarely. And I know some more extremist sects some very, you know, religious sex, ultra orthodox do have this concept and they talk about it a little bit more, but sort of if you die and you, you know, you kind of like go be with God, you know, that's sort of basically it. And no one ever talked about hell ever. And again, more extremist, very, uh, very orthodox. Again, they have a concept of what happens if you don't do these things. But I grew up being told we don't even believe in heaven or hell. There's no hell in Judaism. There's no heaven. That's not what's important. What's important is what you do on earth, how you act on earth, how you treat people, how you treat your parents, whether you follow the rules, you know, whether you're a good person, whether you practice tikkun olam, repairing the world, you know, you know, that you have this obligation to do these things, you have an obligation to, you know, act righteously, you know, um, those were the things that I, you know, and again, like, no, it's not a big concept. And, but, you know, I don't want to generalize. There are some very orthodox sects that do have more of a, of a heaven slash hell, more heaven than hell concept, but nowhere near at all, nothing like Christianity or Islam, especially, you know, I grew up in the United States. So there was Christians are, are always concerned about people's souls after they died. And I always found that to be so utterly confusing. I'm like, first of all, why do you care about that person's soul after they die? Shouldn't you care about this? If you care about people outside of your family and yourself, shouldn't you care about them while they're alive? Wouldn't that be the best way to demonstrate your concern? <laughs> so yeah. no, not really, not at all. Yep. Um, and the uh, music guy, Rivka, do you have any children who are interested in religion or do they agree with your viewpoints in atheism? My, I have one daughter, my daughter, um, she's never said she's an atheist, but I don't think she has any religiosity whatsoever. You know, when she was very young, like I said, we did, um, I had friends who were Wiccans, you know, they, w pagans. And so sometimes we would go to their solstice celebrations or their May Maybon or, you know, celebrations, Yule, things like that. But there was never, our household was never, you know, there was never a God concept. I never taught her about that. I never even brought it up. Um, I do remember when she was about 
four or five, she was playing with these some girls next door and she came home crying. And I had asked her, you know, like what happened? And she said, Oh, she was over at Lisa's house. And Lisa said, everybody who loves Jesus, raise your hand. And my daughter didn't raise her hand. First of all, I'm not even sure if she knew who Jesus was. And so she didn't raise her hand. So the little girl told her she had to leave. Well, you that's... know, so I remember that her asking me, like, what's the deal? And I'm like, don't worry about it. She's just being small minded. She only believes in Jesus because her mom told her to, you know. And my daughter also used to ask me all the time if I believed in Santa Claus. And I really don't think it's a good idea to lie to children. Sometimes you have to keep things from children because they're children and they're not psychologically and emotionally capable of knowing things, but to straight out lie, you know? And so I, I would always say, well, I believe in the concept of Santa Claus in that you want to give things to people and you should be good and, you know, and she'd say, she would keep saying, but no, do you believe it? You know, and I, you know, and yeah. that was her asking for that. And I would never give it to her because I just don't think it's fair to lie to children. And um, the same, you know, there was never an Easter bunny. She wanted to do some sort of spring thing. So I would always tell her she, you know, she had to look under a flower for this, the, the, you know, the maiden of spring. And I would just give her a little doll. You know, that only lasted till she was like nine, you know, and then she was yeah. done with that eight or nine. But no, I, I don't think my daughter is a believer at all, but she does identify as Jewish, but not religiously, ethnically. Yeah. Um, and Maron is saying it wasn't a huge deal to my family that I didn't believe in God, but it was very difficult for them that I no longer identify as Jewish or feel an attachment to the holidays. We have another ex-Jew in the live chat. That's good. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, and, and I agree with Anne that, you know, the not believing in God, again, like people are like, whatever, it's not important. Believe, don't believe. Does he exist? Does he not exist? But everything you do, do as a Jew is what's more important, you know, not necessarily believing yeah. God who cares, but, you know, going to the, you know, synagogue, you know, giving your child a Hebrew name, having, you know, circumcising your child, all these things. Yeah. Um, my, I, so I, I absolutely do understand about that. Yeah. Although I don't know if I ever told my mother directly face to face like i don't believe there is a god i you know i think maybe she surmised that <laughs> but i don't think i actually ever said to her i am an atheist yeah i mean i think it shouldn't even be need to say it. like you just raise your children secular or like without believing and like eventually, I don't think people will need to say like the term atheist only exists because like there are theists. Like the normalized thing right now is theism to believe in God, whatever religion you are in, wherever mm -hmm. you are in the world. The normalized thing is that you are a believer. So the term atheist exists only because of that. Atheos, which is like no God in Greek. So, yeah. And I, you know, uh, to, to talk about Anne's, um, comment i think some of the and i could be wrong you know maybe this is different in her family but this idea about not identifying as jewish a lot of that is what i was you know saying that that there's this like how can you turn your back on your your tribe your people you have an obligation to say you're a jew you know kind of thing especially because of the history of persecution and things like that so i mean that's in some ways I get that, you know, like that is a big deal for a lot of people's families. Yeah, um, here's my theory. I, uh, the far right, like currently the far right goes against Muslims in most countries, except for the non-Islamic countries, uh, far right goes against Muslims. So going against Muslims in that way, in the far right way, just tends to increase the tribalism amongst Muslims. So for, for example, what I can see in India is like 
Muslims are holding ex-Muslims atheists, even them into the Muslim community. So, for example, there's this guy Javed Akhtar in India. Um, he's he's an ex-Muslim. He's not even an ex-Muslim. He was never a practicing Muslim. Like I think his parents were ex-Muslim. Um, but he recently got, uh, I think last year, he got the Richard Dawkins Award. And he he is not a practicing Muslim. He's an atheist. And he vocally says that he's an atheist. So if you don't believe in Allah, you cannot be a Muslim. Like that's not how it works. But there are Muslims, so many Indian Muslims who still say that, oh, no, he's still a Muslim. Is still in our community, and there are the far right Hindutva people who say, "Oh, we don't care whether you're ex or whatever. You still have the Muslim blood in your body and things like that." That's so exactly are... that. You know, it doesn't matter whether you don't believe in God; you're still a Jew. Yeah. Or you know, so, from the people who are Jewish, but then also the bigots, same as like what you're talking. They don't care whether yeah. you believe or don't believe. They're gonna say that you are this. And they hate you for it. Yeah. It's, it's so free. Persecution just increases the tribalism in people. And that's like so. And the far right is just like increasing what they say they are fighting against. So they, they say they're fighting against Islam. They don't say Muslims. They say Islam, even though they're fighting against Muslims. But they are just helping Islam to stay in power for long, uh, my, helping Islam to live longer because the more tribalistic Muslims are getting, the more, the longer Islam lives. Same for Judaism, even the Judaism right now is really a dying religion. <laughs> so, I mean, I think people like, they just get so tribal. But anyway. Uh, Except for religious da- people have a bunch of, uh, lots of kids. So that, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, music guy saying are Jewish women pressured to have a lot of ch- uh, children to repopulate what was lost in the past exactly that's exactly what so um, a big part of a lot especially these um, Hasidic communities that um, come up in New York or other um, or in Israel too, the very uh, Haredi communities. Yes, there is a sort of drive to, you know, of all these millions, the million children that we lost, you have to, you know, have a lot of children. And also you should, because God says be fruitful and multiply, you know, and then a lot of these um, uh, very religious uh, groups of people, you know, that's your function in a lot of ways as a woman, even though with, so what's really interesting, especially about some of the ultra Orthodox is that the women, there is a misogynistic bent, but the women, a lot of them are the ones who actually are the breadwinners and who work because the men spend all day studying. Yeah. I, I think I know about this. Like and in Israel, so yeah. you're working, but then your job is also to keep the house also to have a bunch of kids also to raise these kids. So it's a very, um, interesting, you know, dynamic and yeah. And I know culturally in Israel, even if the secular people, there's this cultural concept that you should have children. You have to have children. Even if you're, secular that you have to have at least a boy and a girl and that's that's sort of i remember and i don't know if this was cultural or if this is actually somewhere in scripture but my mother would always say you should have a boy and a girl you have to have one of each a son to carry on your name a daughter to you know so yeah so and of course my parents had a boy and a girl and her parents had a boy and a girl you know so even if you don't have more than you know, a lot of kids, you have to have two, one boy, one girl. Yeah. So answer to your question, music guy, religious Jewish women. Yes. The answer is yes. Yes. Um, music guy is also saying my mother went crazy too when I got it. At yeah. And to just to backtrack one more thing about the uh, having a lot of children. That's why a lot of very religious people and even like my parents who my dad wasn't as religious. It's so important that you marry a Jew so that the kids will be Jewish. You know, that your son has to marry a Jew. It's not as important that your daughter, but she really should. But, you know, God forbid your son doesn't marry a Jewish, you know, 
or she, if she doesn't convert, you know, yeah. then the, you know, the, the, that we're going to get watered down and we'll be lost to, you know, history. Um, and he's saying Rivka is correct about my family's perspective. So you're correct. Um, David is saying about to go. Good night. Good night, David. Uh, Mustard saying, yeah, they really seem to have strengthened the concept of like your religion being inherent, inherited and can't remove uh, rather than just an ideology, which you believe. Yeah, it's it sucks. Uh, but I think that's it for like the questions in the chat. I wanted to ask one thing, like I forgot to ask this before, um, which is like conversion to Judaism. You just mentioned this now, so I remembered it. Um, because like people say Jewish like in ethnicity, but are there people nowadays who really convert to Judaism? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and how, it's, a, it's a process. I'm sorry, yeah, you were I, gonna ask? Yeah, I was about to ask like, what's the process? It's a huge process. See, so Jews, unlike Christians and Muslims, don't proselytize. Like, you have to come to us. We're not going to you, you know, a sort of idea, you know, like that's the idea that they would have, you know, like you have to really want it too. And yeah. so there's classes that you have to take and you have to study. And it's not just like in Islam where you say the Shahada, you know, and you're, a Muslim, or, you know, you get up for in church and say, Jesus is my savior. Boom. Safi, you're done. You know, no. And if you're a man and you're not circumcised, if you, if you're converting in a secular humanistic Jewish synagogue, and probably if you're in a reformed synagogue, although I could may some reformed might still make you, you have to be circumcised. So you have to get circumcised as an adult because that's the covenant between God and Abraham. So it's more than just the classes and it can take up to a year even in some places and the, you know, learning all these things and, you know, proving that you really want it because sometimes they'll even say no and you have to come back and then like, okay, you know, you really want it. Um, but yeah, you have to get circum men have to get circumcised. So yeah. you do really have to want it if you're a man. But there there it goes. So if you're if you're a religious person, you're probably not going to marry a, a non-Jew. But if you're a person who isn't necessarily religious, but as we talked about, at some point this seems to matter to people when you get to marriage and children, then you know, you might want to convert the the wife would have to convert more so for some of those people the husband yeah it's it's a shame he's not jewish but the mother's jewish so the kids are fine sort of idea yeah and one last thing uh wait i think that has another question from me what do jews think about non-jews in terms of what they believe in do they just believe they are wrong but don't care so you I know, think he's asking like, yeah. There's several. So if you're very, very religious and you are, you know, kind of an extremist, you do like a Satmar Hasid or, you know, some of these extreme, they may not necessarily have as favorable a view of Gentiles. Like, you know, it's okay to have... Um, a Shabbos goy, you know, come turn on the lights for you or something. But, you know, and there's um, even passages about, you know, Gentiles kind of serving. And I don't know exactly what they are, but but you can find stuff like that. And then I think in my experience, a lot of um, Jewish people aren't necessarily concerned about what other people are doing or not doing unless Again, like you're very kind of extremist, then you may be concerned. But where the concern is, is the prejudice that the non-Jews may have towards you. For That's maybe more of the concern. So maybe that's why. Although I do remember my mother telling me once that I could eat at a Muslim's house, but I couldn't eat at a Christian's because we knew that the Muslims weren't going to have pork in their house. But you never know, you know. So 
this is a, you know, thinking about what other people believe, right? This is my mother actually have, you know, thinking, what do other people believe? Well, Muslims don't believe in eating pork, so it's safe, you know, but, um, in my experience, you know, um, like I said, that no one's going out and, you know, proselytizing. Uh, okay. Um, last thing I wanted to ask is not about Judaism, but rather just from your perspective is like, um, so it's very difficult in cases of both like Judaism and Hinduism. For most people, it is very difficult to like differentiate their religion and the ethnicity. Um, so for like, there's this group of people, ex-Hindus in India, who are like about thinking of like they have been inspired by the success of the ex-Muslim movement and they are like thinking about like popularizing the term ex-Hindu um, because it's not very popular. People don't really like the Hindu atheist is there. Um, they just consider you Hindu even if you're an atheist in most places. But the term ex-Hindu is not that popular and there aren't many people like when I started calling myself ex-Hindu, the only reason I did is because I didn't see anyone else doing it and I wanted to make it popular. And same for ex-Jew as well, it's, which is like you call yourself an ex-Jew, but most people don't. They can say, oh, I'm an ethnically Jew, but I'm an atheist, but like no one uses the term ex-Jew. So what do you think can be done to make to just popularize these terms like ex Jew, ex Hindu, just kind of. you know, that's an interesting question because most of the people and and I only started using ex Jew specifically when I started um, doing the Atheist Republic News because we had ex Muslim, ex Hindu, ex Christian. I always called myself an atheist Jew, you know, but and most Jewish people that I or you know atheists who are of Jewish. Um, ancestry um that's what they call themselves um and this gets to the question that murtad skeptics was talking about and that you were taught we we've been talking about quite a bit is this sort of irrevocability of the type of the name you know it, it doesn't go uh. away whether you believe in god or not and a lot of that is because some people also believe that Jews are a race. So if you were Asian or black, you wouldn't say I'm an ex-black, right? Even if you necessarily maybe yeah. didn't identify with the culture or something, right? So that, I mean, you could, but that's sort of how people, a lot of people look at Judaism like there's no way to not be it because you're a tribe and some people yeah. think you're a race. Like my grandfather's, I have his citizenship papers and it's on where the race category is. It says Hebrew. So this is with the thinking in, you know, the, the thirties when he came to the United States, that that was his race. He's a Hebrew. So he can't get out of it either because, it, you know, um, so, yeah, I don't see it being very popular. What I do hear people say often is I don't identify as Jewish. Um, David Silverman, uh, my friend David Silverman, the one who gave that talk, I'm not a Jew and you aren't either. He says he's not Jewish. You know, he just. I've never yeah. heard him say ex-Jew, but yeah, I don't know how you would popularize that because there's this, um, the tie between, and as you stated, there isn't really a different name for the ethnic cultural part versus the religious part. It's the same thing. And it's also difficult because like is like Islam, many Muslims, it's so encompassing of everything, right? How, how you have yeah. sex, how you go to the bathroom, what, how, what shoe you put on, you know, blah, 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 that it just, I, I'm not sure how you would do that. And you're right. Most people don't. Yeah. So because this is like one of my goals is to popularize the term ex-Hindu. It's not many people, not enough people are using it. I've been seeing more and more lately, more and more people are using it, but it's still not enough. And I think uh, 
I would rather have like more and more people just calling themselves ex-Hindu. And I think it can happen because a lot of people are like, it's a counterculture to the far right in India right now. A lot of people are just uh, against that Hindutva thing. And so I think it might happen, but it will take some time, I guess. And, but, you know, it happens yeah. to me sometimes. People say, oh, you're Jewish. I'm like, no, I'm Jewish, but I'm an atheist. I'm like, well, yeah. wait a minute, you know, where, well, no, I'm not because I don't believe, but yet I very much identify with the culture because, so it's, your your point about the terminology is really important. There isn't really another word, yeah. you know? So like, I mean, in Islam, you could call yourself a kafir, right? You know? Yeah. Or a murtad. <laughs> yeah. But, and I get it uh so i think we're done with the live chat and as well so rivka uh do you uh have anything last thing to say or promote your social media accounts? well i do have a page it's uh called kent community secular alliance on uh, facebook and instagram so if you're interested in that you're welcome to uh it's a secular page about you know secular issues atheist issues humanist issues um and yeah no i very thank you so much for um oh thanks music guy thank you so much for inviting me i don't know if i provided a whole lot of specific insight um you know it's been so many years since i really studied anything so i can't give you a lot of answers and like i said i just tuned it out as a kid because i just did not want to be part of it but i hope that maybe the discussion was informative about, you know, at least myself and how I perceive, you know, my relationship with Judaism or non-Judaism. Yep. And that was it. Uh, so people leave after the uh, stream ends, leave your comments in, uh, below. If you want uh, Rivka maybe again in future, if you want me to invite her again, and I hope she comes again if I invite her. I would, lo I would love to. I have, you know, we could talk more about some other aspects of, you know, like the, the political uh, power of very religious Jews in Israel and New York, you know, we could talk about, we don't even have to talk about Judaism. We could just talk about secularism. I have a lot to say about that. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah, would be thank interesting. Thank you so much. Yes, and okay, so follow me below on my Facebook page, Twitter account, and you can also join my Discord server. I have my own Discord server as well. You could join there. And or if you like it, if you want to support me, I also have a Patreon where I also release Patreon exclusive videos. I have released one right now. So if anyone becomes a patron, you can watch the patron exclusive video. It's on Krishna and Radha and their story, which is very similar to Muhammad and Aisha. Spoiler. Um, that, and I will be releasing more videos uh, as I get more patrons. Uh, so there and the next, I will probably release a video soon because I haven't released any videos for a month. Uh, the next video will probably be the treatment of atheists and apostates in Sikhism. So stay tuned for that but anyways um bye everyone and thank you rivka for again for being here and your awesome commentary i love it but yes bye everyone bye bye